I'm pretty sure on the uh, Canterbury, this was called the White and Black Lodges or something. Oh, oh this is? Okay. Yeah. But esoteric and pseudo-esoteric schools is more oh, okay. what it's about. White okay. and Black Lodges seems a little bit like more yeah. mystical or something. Yeah. This is actually more practical than that. So I guess we'll get right into it. This one is, this is one that I was interested in even before I came. Here to Gnosticism, and it's one that I studied a lot before I came to Gnosticism. Was that the different various schools and the different beliefs and the different? Uh, it was strange to me why so many came up, and you'll find that a lot of them have the same roots. Uh, there's some schools that are considered to be true esoteric schools, and some that are pseudo esoteric, which doesn't always mean that they're bad or wrong. It just means that they're lacking in the full information. They have part of it maybe, and other parts they omit or they don't know. Or they were just focused on one aspect of the work, so that's what they formed their school around. Such like this. So we'll start off with a quote. Uh, Many schools exist. All of them are necessary. All of them serve to help the human being. But it is good to warn that no theory can engender the internal bodies. We have never seen anyone born from any theory. We have not met yet the first human being who is born of theories. So all schools exist, there's many of them, and they're all necessary, they all have purpose, they all have a place, um, but the important thing to remember is that by reading books or studying with different schools or, or learning a vast amount of theories doesn't really bring you to know the inner worlds or the higher worlds or your higher bodies, because theories won't get us there, practice is what gets us there, direct experience gets us there. Although it serves a purpose to read about it, it serves a purpose to study different systems. It's just not the be-all to end-all. This is another quote from Samuel. We are not against any religion, school, sect, order, or lodge, because we know that all religious forms are manifestations of the great cosmic, universal, infinite religion, latent in every atom of the cosmos. We teach the synthesis of all religions, schools, orders, lodges, and beliefs. Our doctrine is the doctrine of the synthesis. So, that's why he's saying we're open to all these different systems. That's why we study many systems. Nordic mythology, uh, the Hebrew Kabbalistic systems. We know that a lot of systems are all based on the same principles. They all maybe have a different form around those principles, but nonetheless, the same principles can be found in many different religions, schools, sects, whatever. Now we'll talk about theories. Many people who are seeking knowledge of the real path can be misled in many ways. Indeed, the Black Lodge uses and promotes a confusing amount of pseudo-spiritual ways in order to cause chaos and confusion and to lead people away from the true path. It's important to be able to distinguish between religious belief, esoteric knowledge, and pseudo-esoteric information. So there are so many paths out there that it can be confusing. Why is there so many paths? All of them say that they're the right path. How do you know which one's the right path? How do you know which one's not the right path? And it is a, it's a difficult thing to try and figure out. So basically what we say is you have to put some work in, you have to do some exercises, verify some things for yourself about any sect or belief or system, this one included, this one especially. So. It says many people are seeking knowledge, but they can be misled in many ways. And the Black Lodge uses and promotes a confusing amount. That is true. There, there are forces that are working against us. But it's not always just the Black Lodge. Sometimes it's people who have reached a certain degree of their being, a certain level. And they, for lack of reaching the higher levels, believe that's all that there is. So someone might have become fairly well off at astral projection, and they think... Astral projection, I, I can ascend to heaven. This is heaven. This is where heaven lies. And they can have a whole bunch of schools based, or teachings, or a school based around the idea that the astral plane is the superior plane, when in fact there are planes above it. But they might not know this. So it's not an intentional misleading of people, but this is why it's important to study and know for ourselves. How do we do that? It's important, first of all, it's important to be able to distinguish between religious belief, esoteric knowledge, and pseudo-esoteric information. Religious belief, we'll start with. When there is no longer an awakened master in the physical plane, or when the believers reject another master of the White Lodge, 
The living esoteric guidance is lost, and the esoteric knowledge eventually becomes a religion. So this is one thing where you say Jesus was around, just as Christianity, for an example, for example. He's teaching a certain thing. He has followers who are believing a certain thing. He dies many years later, 300 years later, is from the Gnostic uh, Gospels lecture. We see that Constantine forms a religion. Jesus was no longer around to guide it, so who knows if they were following what he actually taught or not. And then it, as time goes on and there's no real masters to lead them, it degenerates and degenerates until it's just religious belief. <clears throat> as time passes by, the esoteric meaning of the teachings hidden in the symbols becomes obscure and lost. Through time, the level of consciousness of humanity gradually drops as the ego strengthen and as the teachings themselves become obscured. Sometimes the society in which they were given has disappeared and it is normal for the organization to split into different religious factions and groups once there is no master to guide it. This can be seen pretty much in every order, in every religion, in every school, in every sect. As soon as the person who was leading that group is gone, the sect usually ends up splitting, like Christianity split into numerous, numerous sects. Most Pardon? The Muslims, too. The Muslims, exactly. They yeah. split into new, even, even more esoteric schools, the so Theosophical Society, for example. It doesn't matter if you're familiar with it or not. They had a leader named Blavatsky. She died, and then it oh, yeah. split into different people who said, well, this is what she, what she would have wanted us to do. And then another person said, no, no, that's wrong. This is what they want. And then they split. So it happens in every group. happens in every order. It's just, I guess it's part of the process because it repeats in every system, it seems to. Uh, <clears throat> time passed by, the esoteric meaning of the teaching, which is hidden in the symbol, can become lost. This is true. Sometimes people will, ha will put a lot of their knowledge into a symbol, and then the, the, those students working directly with the master or, or the person who was event first leading the school, they knew what, was in the, what the symbol meant to them. They were taught by him. As it gets further and further away by him, or as the students become more and more strengthened in their ego and they start to they start to lose what that real meaning of those symbols were. Uh, Freemasonry I think is, is a great example of that where there's so many ancient symbols in the organization and no what seems to be real coherent understanding of why they're there or what they actually mean this kind of thing. And this last point is I like this one too that sometimes the society in which these teachings were given has disappeared or no longer exists. This is sometimes why it's hard for for like us in the West, to totally grasp a teaching that originated in the East is very difficult for us. I mean, we can work hard and we can intellectually understand it, but it was made in a time and for people who were more geared to that teaching. So it becomes a little more difficult for us to understand it, simply because we're not from that culture, we don't have that background, we, we, don't, we haven't had that lineage of uh, understanding or that culture. And maybe they're at a stage of development, another culture at another stage of development, where their ability to understand things is at a different level. So they can understand easily one system of learning, where us, it's confusing. <laughs> Sometimes the terminology is just confusing. But this is part of what eventually becomes religious belief. So all religions conserve, conserve the eternal values. All religions are necessary and all religions fulfill their mission in life. It's the same, we're not saying anything negative about religions. They all serve a purpose. In fact, if people weren't religious, we would be even, in some cases you say we'd be, we'd be worse off than we are now. Because at least these, at some level, mo all religions have the esoteric teachings. They're just more veiled. And people start to take them literally. But if someone had a different or a higher level of being, and they were placed in a Christian organization, say, or a Muslim, they could, through their, just, just because of their own level they were at internally, they could understand the deeper messages without it being explained to them. But for the mass of people, this is probably something very difficult to do. Every religion is born, grows, develops, multiplies into many sects, and dies. And this is uh, something we can verify for ourselves pretty easily by any kind of comparative religion study or anything like that. But the religious principles never die, the religious forms can never die, but the eternal values are redressed with new forms. So this is also an interesting thing, 
all these wars over religion, but if you were, went down to the principles of all the religions, they're all basically built around the same truths, teach the same principles. They even pretty much all have the same, we'll say solar, solar hero, the same person who represents the Christ force. <coughs> okay, you have Buddha, obviously you have Jesus, Muhammad. They all have their own teacher who came, gave the message, struggled, was persecuted, died, ascended to heaven. All religions pretty much teach about a higher planes of heavens and lower planes of hells. And uh, so really the only thing that I guess in our society makes it possible for people to have war on religious grounds would be an ignorance towards other religions. Because if you study other religions, you would say, oh, they're basically telling us the same thing. <laughs> right? Or, or if the leaders of these religions now, they become... Like everyone, they develop, they develop the ego, it becomes much stronger, and they start taking things literally, and then they start purposely misleading other people for political gain, power, money, whatever. The Vatican, and, as an example. There's a lot of radical Muslims who are mislead, trying to mislead their people and misrepresenting them by trying to say that the jihad is a war against the infidels people who aren't Muslims, when in reality, if you read the book, it's, it's more of an eternal war. It, they're talking about a jihad as a holy war. What's the holy war? It's the war on yourself, the war on the ego. The same as Jesus talking about how to deliver yourself from sin. These, the, the messages are always the same. The teachings are the same. Even the people giving the teachings are very similar. So, that's my little spiel. <laughs> so, religious belief. In belief, one accepts what one has not directly experienced. So that's what we're defining as belief. We're not saying it's good or bad. We're just saying people accept it as a fact, whether they've directly experienced it or not. But knowledge is gained from direct personal experience. This is the difference. So in belief, one accepts what we have not directly experienced. So that's not always a bad thing. I mean, we're in these teachings. We haven't directly experienced everything, but we know that it's important that we try to, that we work towards doing that. It's also important to be open to things that we haven't experienced, but not to just blindly believe what someone else is telling us as a fact. That's what religious belief is. So I, I put this picture here because this is a pretty good example. It doesn't matter if you've experienced astral projection or not, but if you, um, like so, for example, someone who's experienced astral projection, they would have what's called faith in astral projection. No longer is it a belief. It's moved on to faith. What is faith? That means inside of them, internally, they know that this is real and it exists and there's nothing that anyone else could say to them to say, listen, I read a lot of books on it. This is some kind of weird thing that the brain happens when you're falling asleep. Uh, you could say, okay, yep, yeah, but inside you would know because you have faith. The belief says, well, I believe astral projection is true. It makes sense that it is. I believe it. But until you directly experience it, this is how you develop faith. So faith and belief aren't the exact, they're not the same. Faith is higher. Faith is no matter what anyone says about you, you'll know astral projection is real because I experienced it. Or whatever, you can use any example. Something that you know for a fact that other people might not believe. Because you have the knowledge. Right, you have the direct knowledge. That's right. You've had that experience, and you, you can say, so, right? Yeah, you know it is. Someone could say, "I don't believe Russia exists," or something like this. And you're like, "No, I've been there. <laughs> it exists." Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is an example. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> no puns intended. <laughs> you are from Russia, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> this is an example. Yes. I, I think something that's also important to touch on is the fact that um, even faith can be created by our egos. Um, in many cases, when people start to explore astral projection and get results, they'll be looking for something or expecting something. And in turn, because their mind has the, or their egos have the ability to create in the astral plane, they actually see what they're expecting to and then form faiths based on it. And that's where a lot of the pseudo. Um, Esoteric yeah. schools come from. Possible. This is possible. But usually when we say faith, it's yeah, it's 
the knowledge of, of something that we've experienced directly, usually in the absence of the ego, but yeah, yeah I understand. It's something, uh, I don't know if I mentioned before also that uh, talking about these beliefs and experiences and everything, uh, one time a disciple asked the Master, uh, Master, do you believe in God? And he said, no, I don't, because I know it. So religion, uh, belief and, and, and direct experience are two op op uh, opposite things. Yeah. Exactly. Because the master has already experienced God, uh, he had already united with God, so it's a different. Yep. It's not a belief, what we right. call belief. It's yeah. just direct experience. Yeah, that's right. He knows. Yep. He knows exactly. Yeah. He he doesn't believe. He just right. knows. Even when you say something, and we all know this, when you say, "I believe in this," when you say the even use the word "believe," it also has a connotation that says, "I believe this is true." That means, I, I, I think that's true, but I also accept the possibility that it's not. Yeah. That's why we use that word, belief. So it's, it, that just lets you know the word belief means no direct personal experience. That you, you don't know. You don't know. But this is what your idea may be. So faith would be higher than that. Direct experience is higher than that. Now we'll talk about esoteric knowledge. Esoteric information explains about the path to the awakening and includes clear information about all three key components of the path to liberation. I want to do a quick spot test. What are the three key components to the liberation? Birth, or the death, birth? sacrifice. Yes. Uh -huh. You got it. Birth, death, and sacrifice. <laughs> Imprinted on my brain. Yep, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> They're for me. <laughs> Those are the most important. Yeah. <laughs> so through these three keys, this enables a person to get on the path and to actually walk along it and to awaken. So there are some schools that maybe they understand some of these concepts. Maybe they teach death or sacrifice, <coughs> but not all three of them. And there are some schools who um, they know about these three keys, but they don't quite understand exactly how to practice them. So, like as an example, me and my brother once, we went to the Theosophical Society here in London. They're, and they're a really nice bunch of people and they really study a lot of deep esoteric things. And while we were there, we got spot quizzed because she knew we were from the Gnostic organization. And she thought, so she was testing us, but she was nice about it, but we immediately realized that we were being put to the test. And she said, so, uh, and all these, that's, that's a true, true organizations, they teach three things. They ever teach the same masters that we all teach three things? Yep. What, birth, death, and sacrifice. And she was pretty surprised that we had said that, because I guess in the Theosophical Society, they know these are the three keys, but when we asked her about specific, specifically about certain keys, the information there was lacking. So she didn't know the answer. Just that you have to work with birth, death, and sacrifice. Because the, the Theosophical Society is, is a good movement, I guess. I mean, I'm not saying you should go out and join it or anything. Master Samael says he studied there briefly when he was a young man. Uh, but it, it's very theoretical. It's almost entirely theoretical. It's reading out of books about higher planes and about astral bodies and about elementals. But there's no real... From what I could tell there, from what I could tell of the material, there was no real laid out practices of how to develop anything within yourself. Like a lot of these pseudo-esoteric groups, and I'm, they will say things like, all we have to do is realize that we are already divine. Which is fine to say, but there's no, just realize, okay, I'm just going to realize it. I don't know how to just realize something. It's like saying, just, just see it. <laughs> there has to be more clear information given more practices, advice on how this can be achieved, which are a lot of the practices we give here. Uh, the information also needs to be able to reach others. This is why esoteric organizations are formed. A true esoteric organization is founded by someone who has reached mastery and has sufficiently advanced along the path. 
Then the esoteric work is alive and guidance can be given to the students. So that's pretty straightforward. But the reason why there are so many different sects is because the information needs to get out there. So someone thinks that the, they, they reach the top, they, they feel like they have to share the information. Why does the information have to get out there? Why are like why is the Gnostic? It's because to to you must give to receive. Everything's a gift. But you have to pay for it. So it seems contradictory, but the more you give, the more you receive in turn. Like think of the whole teaching as a ladder. You're on a specific rung. There are people above you, there are people below you. If you want to get to the next rung above, you have to help the person below you onto the rung that you're standing on. This is one of the cosmic laws. This is, this is how spirituality works. They don't give anything for free. Pseudo-esoteric knowledge. There is an abundance of spiritual and esoteric information that is inaccurate or which lacks sufficient information to explain the path. Uh, this type of information is pseudo-esoteric since true esotericism contains all the necessary information for final liberation. Many people claim that they are masters, that they have awakened, but very few have. It takes an enormous effort over many years to be in a position to explain about true esotericism. Huge tests and trials must have been undergone, and the relevant esoteric grade must have been earned. So, to form a, an esoteric school, it's, it's pretty serious. And if the person who forms that school isn't internally at a certain level, then it would become like a pseudo-esoteric school because all the knowledge isn't there. And it, it's, it's interesting that even in our everyday society, pseudo-esoteric information comes forward. It comes forward in many different forms and you don't even realize that it's some kind of spiritual teaching or it was, this, this is part of our society. There is one kind of a craze that happened recently and it was, it was a book that became quite popular and it was called The Secret. And it's, it's a, no, it's a good book, and it teaches certain principles that are occult or esoteric. It teaches certain laws, but it omits other laws. It teaches the laws of attraction. This is a law. You can attract things through your thoughts and your actions. This, this is possible. But they omit talking about the ego, that, is, that if you feed your desires, that's maybe not the best thing for spiritual development. Because... In the in that uh, the the secret, they they could have gone the other way. They could have said you can better your life by gaining insight into who you are or why you're here. But they they went the uh, way of saying you can better your life by acquiring more cars or money or or whatever. This is an it's it's an occult or esoteric principle, uh, the law of attraction. But there's also the law of the pendulum that if you if you if you're pushing so far towards desire, you will also swing back into pain that far. So it's just an example of, of one system where, and the reason why I bring that one up specifically is I, I've read the book and I was watching the movies too before I got into this, so I, you know, I, I'm familiar with it, is that it's not ever really portrayed as a, a spiritual teaching, as esoteric teaching or occult teaching, but in reality it, it is. It's, it's occult uh, principles that have been around for a long time that have been written about since at least the 1700s. It's just they don't give you all the information to correctly decide how to use the, what, the, the one piece of information they're giving you. They don't exactly tell you how to properly use the law of attraction, is all I'm saying. They, they, wanna, they aim it towards the ego because this is how you sell <coughs> books and movies. Mm -hmm. But there is a deeper teaching there, in there, that is sometimes not found. I remember when I read it, I thought, does this stuff really exist? Is there a law of attraction? And then I started looking into deeper, like, what are other laws like this? So there, there is a platform there that can lead you into deeper and deeper teachings. But it can also be misled. And like, I'm, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not picking on any systems or schools or anything, because like I said, they all, they all serve a purpose. They're all serving a, a reason, but we just need to understand a little bit about them. <clears throat> to that, we're going to talk about the four schools, something Master Samael talks about. 
There exist numerous systems, all of them claiming to have the truth. The majority of these numerous sects, orders, lodges, esoteric societies, etc. <coughs> can be divided into four schools. Number one, schools that teach how to crystallize soul. Number two, schools that teach how to crystallize soul and to incarnate the spirit, the being. Schools, and the number three is schools that serve as a kindergarten for humanity. And the number four is the authentic schools of black magic. So, those are the four schools he talks about. Most of those schools all fall into this category, schools that serve as a kindergarten to humanity. There are less schools that teach the higher learnings, but... What was the first one? The first one, schools that teach how to crystallize soul. We'll, we'll get into them, but oh, okay. there are a few, not so many. There's less of these. There's also not as many schools of actual black magic, but the ones there are are pretty serious. So, schools that teach how to crystallize soul. Now, this is just the, the, the terminology he used, he used to explain the schools. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find it confusing when he uses the word soul and spirit, but... We'll tell you, because sometimes in the context they changed as to which one was which. And, but for schools that teach how to crystallize the soul, we'll talk about it. Crystallize the soul is more like the elimination of the ego in this way that he's talking. Elimination of the ego. The ego. Oh. Yeah. So schools that teach how to crystallize soul. We do not yet possess the soul. We possess the essence, the psychic material, the prima matter for crystallizing the soul. So... This, this teaching is, is very widely known everywhere except for the Western society, Western world. Like many other religions, they also say that we don't have a soul yet, but in Christianity came to Western civilization, they said, no, we already possess the soul. We already have the soul, the work is done, we just have to wait, and then when we die, we go to heaven. <laughs> is what the saying is. But... It is necessary to awaken the consciousness, to awaken the essence, to strengthen it, to individualize it. This is called crystallizing the soul. So freeing the essence from the ego, those are the, those are the schools that he considers teaching how to crystallize soul. <clears throat> Only he that has a soul can teach others the complete theory of the crystallization of the soul. So... Like, for, as an example, Buddhism would be un under one of these schools where they, they work to free the mind of desire and this kind of thing. So the, it could be considered schools that teach how to crystallize soul. Um, so we do not yet possess the soul. We possess the essence, the essence, the divine spark. This is the psychic material that the soul is later built from. So we, we possess a fraction, a piece of soul, from which the whole soul can be built. How do we start to do that? First, we have to awaken the essence by eliminating the ego. And there were, there were schools that were formed directly around this idea of destroying the idea of yourself. And, uh, one school that was one of the more famous ones was taught by Gurdjieff. Where it was pretty much all about figuring out who you are and how you operate and this kind of thing. So all schools that teach how to crystallize soul know that humanity has a pluralized eye, the ego, that wastes psychic material in atomic explosions of anger, greed, lust, pride, laziness, gluttony, etc. As long as that pluralized eye exists within us, we will lose the forces of the essence. So sometimes we see it as like a demon that's trapping our higher part, but it can also be seen as energetic force, like a psychic material. We're trying to cultivate it, to use it for higher purposes, but when we have these explosions of anger or greed or lust that we characterize as the ego, it uses up that psychic material, and therefore making it harder for us to cultivate it, to accumulate it, etc. So it is necessary to dissolve the eye if we really want to crystallize the soul. This is the basic idea behind those schools. You have to eliminate the ego, crystallize the essence, strengthen the essence. 
the instructor of a school for the crystallization of soul will work with sparks of essence, helping them in their growth, development, and progress. The disciple has to do the work because the instructor cannot do the work for the disciple. This is also what stands out from these schools. Is they, they'll have a teacher, the teacher can work with the person, can tell the person maybe what they believe they should be doing, but ultimately the work falls on the disciple to, to crystallize their own soul because it's not something that someone else can come and do for you. No one can really investigate your egos for you. And if they did, it would just feel like they're picking on you. So, Every school of souls teaches the technique for the disso dissolution of the ego. Only through the creative comprehension of our errors in all the profound levels of the mind is the I really disintegrated. I believe the lecture Phil gave last week was about this, pretty much how to meditate on the ego so that you can understand it and disintegrate it. So the schools of souls also teach systems and techniques to awaken the powers of the essence. And there are many of these schools that, that were, have existed but were secretive in nature. So it's hard to get the exact information of what they practiced or what they believed, but there were lots of secret society type of schools, especially in the East. There were many of them. The schools of souls teach the science of inner meditation through which the consciousness, the essence, awakens. In this way, we will attain the inner illumination. So many of the schools that teach meditation specifically, if they teach it properly, then they're teaching you how to crystallize the soul. There are also pseudo uh, meditation school where they teach you how to meditate so that you can sleep better or be relaxed or but it's just all this is why it's very important for us to do the work to discover for ourselves is that school something I want to be affiliated with or are, do they, are they teaching me higher knowledge or and secondly we have schools that teach how to crystallize the soul so all we said before and how to incarnate the spirit All schools that teach how to crystallize the soul and incarnate the spirit are schools of regeneration. The schools that teach to crystallize soul only do good work, but those that teach to fabricate the soul and incarnate the spirit do the superior work. Every school of regeneration teaches the masuna, Mathuna, or sexual magic. So this would be the main difference, to have the alchemical teaching plus the previous teaching. So every authentic school of regeneration teaches the three basic factors for the revolution of the consciousness. These three factors are death, birth, and sacrifice for humanity. And it was, it's kind of interesting to think, because I thought before this Gnostic group, is he just talking about this group specifically, or were there actually other groups in the past who taught this? And you can find that, that there were. There were many, there were not many, but there were groups who taught what's being taught here what Sam uh, on War's mission was to, was to unveil it so that everyone could have access to it. He didn't invent it. He didn't make up the, the teachings. He didn't make up uh, the alchemical practice. <clears throat> it was in existence before. And it was in existence, there were secret societies who taught it. And I believe there are some still today that teach it, but it's more like on, you reach a certain grade, they teach a certain teaching. You reach another grade, you just uh, masonry isn't one of them, but I, I think there are some. In fact, some of them, there was one that Sam Long War himself mentions, and it was a Rosicrucian group in, uh, in I believe it was Mexico or Colombia. It was uh, the, called the FRA. It was run by Krum Heller. And this is where he first was exposed to the idea of alchemy. Only in that Rosicrucian group, it's taught under, it's the same teaching, but it's taught under the name, uh, it's taught under different names. So, and it has, has a, appeared throughout history in, as different names. Uh, in that group, it's called the Coitus Reservatus, <coughs> same exact idea. So the pluralized eye has to die in order to crystallize the soul, which is the essence. We have to work with the sexual energy, transmitting it through sexual alchemy in order to create the superior or higher bodies and attain the second birth, which is what he says is the incarnation of the spirit. So only with the birth of the being within ourselves do we have true reality. 
In the world there exist thousands of schools that promise wonders, but only the schools of authentic regeneration can produce authentic masters. The schools of regeneration produce true masters of the White Lodge. The Gnostic movement is an authentic school of regeneration because of the fact that it teaches these three keys. A school that teaches the path of fornication is not a school of regeneration. A school that teaches to fortify the eye is not a school of regeneration. By your fruits you shall be known. So, if there are schools out there that, that teach fornication. Even um, like our understanding of Karma Sutra or, or Tantric practices has been, West, in the Western world, it has been tied up as, uh, well, not to conserve the energies, but just to become a master of sexual intercourse or something like this. So the, de the, teacher, the deeper teaching has been lost, apparently. They just bring it over as that. It's funny, but it is true. <laughs> So now we're talking about schools that serve as kindergarten for humanity. There are thousands of schools that serve as kindergarten for humanity. Those schools do not lead anyone to the intimate self-realization, but are useful because they teach the first elemental notions of occult wisdom. Amongst them we have the Theosophical Society, the Pseudo-Occultist Schools, the Pseudo-Rosicrucians, uh, Yogi Centers, Mentalists, pseudo-esoteric centers, etc. So they're useful because this is where people maybe for the first time ever get the first basic understanding of some of the higher principles, spiritual principles. Still very theoretical though. All of those schools have a lot of good and bad, but are useful because through them we learn something about the superior worlds. So here we find hundreds of theories and authors that mutually fight each other while some affirm that respiratory or breathing exercises are good, others say they are bad. Some may say that a t determined thing is white, and others affirm to him that is black. I find a lot of opposing ideas, contradictory ideas in all these schools. Someone saying, this is, how, this is the way to do it, and the other says, no, nope, that's totally false. And they're both theories, so it's hard, hard to know, hard to decipher who's right, who's wrong, which one do I pat? I don't know, I just read this book, and this guy said, do, do this, and, but that guy said, don't do that. It's very confusing. So kindergarten is always useful. The problem would be to stay in it all our life. The kindergarten cannot self-realize us. What the kindergarten can do is give us the elemental information, and that is all. So it is, serves a purpose, and it's a good purpose. There's a lot of information that has been kept intact through these different societies and sects and uh, like Theosophical Society and Rosicrucian groups. But it's easy to be led astray there too because it's all theories. And if someone comes and they put their idea forth as to what that theory means, and someone else comes and says, no, that, his idea was wrong. And this was one of the things that I was really frustrated with when I joined Masonry at first. Thought, All right, let's learn what Masonry is about. No, you can't find two authors who agree on what it is. <laughs> so there are thousands of students that spend their entire life in kindergarten. There are thousands of students that move around from school to school. <coughs> this is also something that happens frequently. I've done it too in the past where I've gone from place to place to place trying to, oh, I'm going to find something. It's out there. I know it's somewhere. Read the theory here, move to the next place. Read the theory there, next place, next place, next place. You're just reading, acquiring intellectual knowledge. There's no real ground. There's no center of gravity. There you can say, is it true? Is it not true? Just I'm just trusting this author. But if someone else says it, well, the opposite. Do I have to just trust them? So the problem with kindergarten, the negative aspect with these schools, is that they are full of people who are mistaken about the importance of the creative energies. People that say sex is something vulgar, dirty, materialistic. There is an abundance of infrasexuals in kindergarten. This is something that Samuel Allen War has stated. And uh, you, you can find it. There, there are a lot of groups. There are a lot of groups who believe in that you have to abstain from sex of any kind that have some basic understanding that our higher principles may be created to the or may be connected to the creative energies but they're not exactly sure of the deeper teaching of how to utilize it so they abstain say oh no you can't this is a group that abstains from sexual intercourse and it was interesting too because like i said when my brother and i went to the theosophical society and we were quizzed on the three factors after that we asked 
because we had read or heard that, that Blavatsky herself practiced alchemical work with her husbands. And this is why she was able to go as far as she did in her knowledge, but that she didn't actually move that teaching down into the Theosophical Society. So we asked her, kind of in a roundabout way, because it's weird to talk about, we asked her if there was any <laughs> sexual teaching or, I, or if there was any importance placed on sexuality in the Theosophical Society. And she said to us, no, and her idea was that sex is related with, with pain, was, was what she told us. So that was an example of someone who knew there was three factors but didn't know exactly what the teaching of those three factors were, or someone who are mistaken about the importance of the creative energies. I just That struck me because I can remember a clear instance in my life where that happened. <laughs> so the Theosophical and the Pseudo-Rosicrucian schools have made the students believe that they already possess the seven bodies. But that concept is false. What has happened is that the clairvoyance of those schools, because of lack of cosmic initiation, have given and information that is deficient. So the fanatics of yogism, uh, pseudo-esotericism, and pseudo-occultism have not comprehended the necessity of creating the inner bodies. They believe that they already have them, and they are misinformed. So there are lots of groups who know about the seven bodies. They call them by the same names. They understand them. They understand the different dimensions and different planes. But they are operating and teaching under the assumption that we possess them already. And uh, a lot of people believe this. I don't know if they believe that maybe when they die, then they'll be able to utilize them. or Because if they believe, I'm not exactly sure what the belief is, how we can already possess them if we can't work consciously in the astral plane or the mental plane or the causal plane or anything like that. So this is interesting because Samuel L. Morris talks about the schools of yoga. Uh, it seems that in the schools of yoga, they can either be the classified under the kindergarten of humanity or the superior schools of humanity based on what they teach. So in the schools of yoga, there is much that is useful and much that is useless. Those that have traveled through India, Tibet, China, Japan know very well that the most serious aspects of yoga is in tantrism. In reality, without the tantrism, it is impossible to reach the level of an adept. So the exoteric or public circle of every school of yoga is kindergarten. It leads people to uh, a basic understanding of higher principles, but it, it can't help them to regenerate themselves or to incarnate the being or build the higher bodies. But the esoteric or secret circle of every school of yoga is a school of regeneration. In the Western world, the yoga has not been comprehended correctly, and there have appeared many people who reject the deeper teaching. In reality, yoga without sex, without mathuna, is like a garden without water. The yoga without sex is kindergarten, not a school of regeneration. But to me, the best statement is also, it's interesting because that lets you know that if you add the alchemical teaching to the yoga teaching, then becomes a school of regeneration. So it's very useful. Now we're going to talk about the big scary one, the schools of black magic. Schools of black magic. The most difficult is to recognize the black schools. Normally they are full of sincerely mistaken people with good intentions. These poor foolish people ignore that they do not yet have the body of conscious will and that they only possess the force of desire. These fanatics believe they are semi-gods and think that divinity can express itself through the people that do not yet have the superior bodies of the they believe they can incarnate a higher force into their being. They try to utilize it without necessarily creating those higher bodies that receives the being, the astral body, etc. Part is, is hard to understand is that normally these people speak against black magic. <laughs> it's not they say, God, we're a black magic society, who wants to join us? It's always cloaked in really high spirituality. You think that they're a very spiritual group. Uh, the fanatics of those schools want to make the subconscious become conscious without troubling themselves to eliminate the ego or working and helping. So this is where some of those schools differ. But as we'll, we're going to see, uh, to be a, an authentic black 
magic school, there are keys that many of the schools who think they're black, they don't possess. So, which is a good thing, because there's people who want to be Satanists or whatever, but they don't possess the actual keys. Just like, as we saw, to be an authentic school of regeneration, the school has to possess certain keys, a certain knowledge. So true schools of black magic possess a key to unlock powers for the use of the ego. So there's three kinds of tantrism that exist. There's white, black, and gray. The schools of white magic are based on white tantrism. Black magic is based on black tantrism. And the schools of gray tantrism are incoherent, vague, imprecise, but they lead the aspirant towards black tantrism. So this is the key. There's white tantrism and black tantrism. Even the keys in black, in the black uh, lodge, is still sexual. So a white adept works with the positive crystallization of the sexual energy. However, there also exists the negative crystallization. The adepts of the black lodge utilize black tantric rituals. These rituals fortify the ego, and they give the ego certain powers. They might not totally understand that they're giving those powers to the ego. But then they could, say, develop clairvoyance. They could develop the ability to astral project. They could develop what seems like higher uh, principles. But they've developed them for the use of the ego, and they've developed them in the in an inferior way. <clears throat> the schools of regeneration forbid the spilling of the end seminists, this uh, creative energy. The, black school, the schools of black magic do not forbid the spilling of the creative energy and even justify it with religious phrases and sentences. In the Western world, the schools of black tantrism hide themselves within the Christ and the Gospels. They speak ineffable things, bless and spill mystically the energy, and use black practices to strengthen the Kunda buffer, to strengthen their connection with the infernal dimen dimensions. Then the sexual energy crystallizes in the ego, strengthening and developing it with all its tenuous, <coughs> submerged, diabolical powers. And this, it seems strange, it's like, I've never heard of any groups that do this, but they exist, they're out there and they're, they're operating today. And I know of, of, of some, but it's not anything that you would like to study too much. It's very strange. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, the basic fundamental objective of true schools of black magic is to develop the Kunda Buffer Organ, the Tale of Satan, to develop their connection with the infernal regions. Uh, the Kunda Buffer could never awaken the seven superior chakras, the ones that we discussed, the rise up the spine, but it does put into activity the uh, antithesis of the seven churches or chakras, the malignant centers or dark chakras of the lower bowels. So there isn't just seven chakras. There are, there are many chakras. There's seven divine chakras. There's also these what do you call, malignant centers. This is sometimes why when people they eat a huge meal, they go to bed, they have nightmares, because these, these chakras are in the intestinal region. It's where they reside. So it can be putting those into activity, which is sending you down into the in, Infernal dimensions, and therefore you're having a dream or an experience down there. It's, it's terrifying for you. So that's the difference between white and black. Right? Without going into too much detail, what what it is that they believe or practice specifically. Now we'll talk about mediums. Mediums were really big in the late 18th century and early 19th century. They were very popular. They're, they're especially in England. There were many schools that came from the schools of mediums. There was also, because it became so popular, there were many, many people who were like sleight of hand tricksters to get money. There may have been some authentic cases of mediums. There were. So mediums are passive and receptive subjects who grant their matter, their body, to metaphysical phantoms from beyond the grave. So if you, they're passive very passive personalities to be able to attract these beings or this energy and let it work through themselves. Spiritualism allows us to communicate with that which is beyond death. This is done through certain path of subjects which are called mediums. 
However, only the shadows of the deceased come into the spiritualist center. These shadows are composed of the psychological eye, or the ego of the deceased. So this is important to remember that a lot of mediums believe that <coughs> channeling divine beings, some even say they're channeling Jesus. In many cases, it's, it's just ego. It's just ego that is being channeled. Because a true master never uses the body of someone else. Would never violate the temple of another person to get their message across. So by manifesting themselves through the mental, astral, and physical bodies of the mediums, the shadows of the deceased produce the dislocation of the mental and astral vehicles of the medium. Uh, and the consequence can be things like insanity. There are certain groups or secret societies who practice this, and it, many of them develop schizophrenia, things of that nature, for allowing other beings or other entities to use their vehicle. It dislocates their actual astral and mental bodies. Which, when you see someone walking around with a dislocated astral and mental body, it seems to us to be some kind of mental condition or some kind of insanity. So the mediums of spiritualism are unable to investigate the superior worlds because they have their mental body dislocated. The mediums of spiritualism are mentally unbalanced, therefore any investigation they attempt to do in the superior world results in failure. Mostly because they are using negative entities, ego, they're believing that the egos are something that they're not, they're seeing things in higher realms very subjectively. And now to get into that further, we're going to talk about positive and negative clairvoyance. So positive clairvoyance is a faculty acquired by those who possess continuous consciousness. Positive clairvoyant knows how to drive his faculty by will. The clairvoyant must learn to see in the absence of the ego. The, the clairvoyant must see without judging, or must see objectively instead of subjectively. So the clairvoyant drives his faculty by will, by willpower, by the work they've done. So what is a, someone who has continuous consciousness? That would be someone who lives in a state of awakened consciousness throughout the day, totally awake, they're aware of their actions, they're aware of what they're doing, what's manifesting through them. They then also can live that way when they sleep, totally conscious. They're not dreaming, they don't dream. Someone who possesses continuous consciousness doesn't dream. They're always awake. So in order to develop positive clairvoyance, it is required to practice the necessary esoteric exercises and to study the best authors of theosophy, Rosicrucianism, yoga, psychology, just for a basic idea of the fundamental theory. This is what Sam Eilmore says. To get an idea of the theory, you have to study some books, but it's more important to do the practices, to do these practices. Positive clairvoyance is achieved only with a great intellectual culture and a great esoteric discipline. The highest cultured people who are submitted to the most rigorous intellectual disciplines achieve the truly positive clairvoyance. The illuminated intellect is the outcome of positive clairvoyance. These are people who have done many practices, have, have, have advanced to a certain level, and have the superior intellect intact. We're not talking about like intellectual people, people who are really good at studying and reading. Because there are many people who go to the astral realm and they'll see something and they'll believe that that they'll subjectively believe in it for exa like example if you're in an astral plane and you see a terrible monster in front of you this could be a projection of your subconscious it might not be an entity that is separate from you so people could believe they see a lion ah, there was a lion they don't understand exactly what it was they don't understand that it was a symbol that their subconscious projected because the, the laws are different in the astral plane this is why it's good to sometimes have a basic understanding that the astral plane, if we're not totally awake, can be extremely subjective. We can create in the astral plane. Our thoughts come to before our eyes. This is what dreaming is. So many clairvoyants fall into error because they believe that their subjective vision is objective. The negative clairvoyant sees without wanting to see. These negative clairvoyants see forms that exist 
within the infraconsciousness of this great nature. These negative seers fall into compulsive suggestion and become cheated by the tenorous entities. This has happened many times in the past. There are many schools where people say they're channeling. Uh, seems these days, instead of channeling the spirit, people are channeling aliens. It seems like uh, we're channeling an alien from beyond. This is the. It's hard to know if you're not objective or you don't have certain faculties whether what you think you're channeling is what you are channeling. And the practice of channeling self is, is, not, is not a great one, and it doesn't help you on the path. It doesn't help you towards your liberation. It actually works against it. So the clairvoyant's worst enemy is ignorance. The ignorance of what it is they are doing, what the consequences are, this kind of thing. Yes? Some of those people who channel um, say, um, say that they can predict a future for someone. Mm -hmm. Is that like almost like, you know, the crystal ball kind of thing? Is that, yeah, that, can that they would get be that through channeling? Could you read um, someone else's future? Like if it, somebody from the other side? This is definitely what they all did back then. They all came to read, to channel so that they could read people's what, futures. What people wanted to it's, know. Maybe if the person did have certain faculties developed, they could see in the astral plane. They could maybe then see what might possible possible outcomes might be. They could possibly be able to do that, but generally, I doubt it mm -hmm. personally. But it's one of those things that I'm not too positive about. So. That's, that, that's been the claim of mediums, to see the future or to predict the future. There have been many predictions about the future. Most of them have been incorrect. But it's because the astral plane is, is different. Time is different there. Right? It shows, it's like in a mathematical equation. If you punch in these numbers, this could be the outcome. But there's a possibility that instead of those numbers, it could be these numbers or these numbers or these numbers. Because depending on what plays out, there's many different possibilities. So, I mean, there was a lot of times the channelers would, they would, uh, a lot of them were fraudulent. They would have tables that floated, but they were on strings and stuff like this. This was mostly in the 19th century when it became very popular. They would claim to have that ectoplasm coming from all their orifices. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. It is more associated with a, a black practice because first of all those people who are truly spiritual they usually don't charge a fee because this is against some of the more cosmic laws some of the higher laws where you're paying a debt by giving information by helping people you're not making a profit from it that's the, that, that's the other thing so we'll talk about something else called the Calcian personality. And this is a personality that is very pre prevalent today in all the esoteric societies and, and uh, people who are really interested in spiritualism, pe people who teach spiritualism. It's called the Calcian personality. So subjective rationalism is the basis for the Calcian personality. Subjective rationalism. That's where they're trying to rationalize all these higher spiritual ideas. They want to make it so that the intellect can understand it. Uh, the Calcian personality is one who feels that he has completed the work because he has acquired a vast knowledge of intellectual theories. They never experience the truth directly, yet they speak about divine things as if they were experts. This, this is very prevalent in today's society. Many people will say, oh, I'm, a, I'm an expert on Buddhism, but they were never really a Buddhist. They just studied the culture and the books, and they have this pride about them because they feel that they understand the whole culture even though they have no real direct experience with anything divine. The Kalkian personality is full of pedantries, like someone who thinks it's very important to be book smart and study many books. It is bottled up in the dogma of evolution, misinformed about the internal constitution of the human being which produces feeling of self-sufficiency. 
misinformed about the dogma of evolution. There is a great dogma in our society that people think they understand evolution. <clears throat> and that through evolution they believe that we will eventually reach perfection. That time will eventually bring us to perfection. That we may be born again and die and then we'll be, if we just wait long enough, if we just live and die and be born again long enough, we will reach perfection. This is a misconception. Because that living and dying and being born again, living and dying and being born again, that's part of nature. That's a process of nature. That's how we serve nature. Nature's goal for us is not to leave nature, but to stay within nature, within the wheel of samsara, to keep coming back and coming back. Because our vibrations are, are utilized by the earth, by nature. So we serve two purposes. We, we receive cosmic vibrations, we, tr we change them internally, and we retransmit them to the earth. The earth is a living entity. That's our, that's our, that's our purpose for nature. That's, that's, our, that's nature's purpose for us. We have a higher purpose as well, to, to realize our higher being, to become spiritual, to understand these higher things. That is something that nature necessarily doesn't want for us, because Nature's already using us like little batteries or power plants or whatever. So the characteristics of the Kalkian personalities are above all their self-sufficiency, their terrible pride, and their vanity based on theories. So this <clears throat> doesn't even have to relate to esoteric teachings. I mean, we put extreme importance on people who have letters behind their names. They have PhDs, or mm -hmm. we think, oh, well, then he must know. He went to school for a long time about it. Maybe that's the case. I'm not saying it's bad that there are people who've gone to school for a long time, but for us to place all our faith in someone because of the amount of time they spent <coughs> in a specific institution might not always be the best for us. So this type of personality from the pseudo-esoteric and pseudo-occultist schools has lost not only the sense of authentic devotion and true religiosity, but also that of veneration. <clears throat> so this school, or this personality, you can see they don't have that devotion. They don't, they don't uh, have veneration for the higher beings, for the higher realms. They think they understand everything. They think they're there already. The Kalkian personality is based on the subjective reasoning which is acquired by the five senses. Subjective reasoning can know nothing about what is real, the divine, about the mysteries of life and death, etc. It is ignorant of all that escapes the five deficient physical senses. There exists another type of reasoning that the Kalkian personality ignores, that is objective reasoning. So the Kalkian personality gets all their information from the five cylinders, the five senses knows nothing really beyond the five senses, but believes that they do. They exist, uh, they, they ignore objective reasoning. Uh, objective reasoning would be seeing things as they actually are, without the filter of the ego, without being identified with the ego. The data of the consciousness is the foundation of objective reasoning. So it is the consciousness that has objective reasoning. Deliberating up through the liberation of the essence, through the elimination of the ego, then we start to develop objective reasoning. We can see the role we played in this specific situation more clearly without having to justify ourselves. Well, this is why I did it, or this is why I had to do it. No, we see it more like person A, person B. You can clearly see your, what, like your, uh, the part that you played in that scenario without being so identified with making sure that you don't end up looking bad. <laughs> Objective reasoning is the, the ability to see the truth without the distortion of the ego. <clears throat> the powers of the heart do exist. These powers are those qualities that are beyond the intellect in this purely reasoning process, and, it, and its purely reasoning process, which the sensualistic subjective reasoning knows nothing about. So the powers of the heart do exist. Intuition exists. Our higher faculties exist. It's hard to know these things if we only rely on the five senses. <laughs> 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 
is tricky. <laughs> Can you make a little more noise? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> So the Colchian personality is not serious. We have to be serious if we want the self-realization of the being. The Colchian personality isn't truly serious. They're not truly serious in developing, developing themselves. They're not truly serious on lo about looking at themselves correctly. They just want to feel almost intellectually superior about esoteric subjects. The seriousness required is that serious, seriousness uh, towards the inner being. This is the seriousness that we need to have. We need to, we need to work for our inner being. We need to sacrifice time, like we're doing tonight, for the inner being. We need to sacrifice time to meditate, to do these practices for the inner being. So it is good to receive information about abstract dimensions from books or lectures or classes, etc. But it is important to do the work to attain direct personal experiences. It's the most important to attain the direct personal experiences. I mean, we still want you all to come back and everything. But... <laughs> Beyond belief. Whoever wishes to discover the true nature of reality needs to practice the right kind of exercises so that these teachings are not just simply beliefs. If you simply believe in the teachings, then these esoteric subjects become almost like a religion for you. People do become fanatical about these teachings. But unless you work on the practices to know them, to verify them, it becomes just like religious belief. But if you disbelieve, you close the possibility of investigation. That's kind of important. We're, we're not telling you, don't believe us until you prove it for yourself. We're saying We're giving you information. This information can be verified for you. If you do the practices, you will verify certain things. If you haven't verified certain things, remain open-minded about them, but work towards verifying them. Belief and faith are different things. Faith is confidence that is derived from direct experience and inner wisdom. It is important to root out beliefs and to question theories by using the practices to verify them with personal direct experiences. It is important, therefore, to practice the exercises and to experience these things and what you have not experienced to keep an open mind about, as I said. So, having beliefs is important, but we also have to say, what are my beliefs? Can I verify them so that we can have faith in them instead of just simply being a belief? So we explain about this path from our own experience and that of the Masters, but it is up to you to verify these teachings. It is up to you to find out if liberation or true knowledge consists of going along one path or not. No one else can do it for you, and a belief will not get you there. So sometimes this is difficult for people. They want to be more passive and just collect theories. They want to have all this intellectual knowledge but there's work that needs to be done, that needs to be done by you. Not that I'm telling you you have to do it, but just that if you want to experience certain things for yourself, you're the one who has to do the work, which is pretty obvious. So we look at these things as directions. Look at these things as directions for your own search, like a map that guides the way. You don't know if the places in the map exist or not, until you go there. But the map is useful nevertheless. Those who have gone far enough esoterically leave behind their maps. And what you experience, if you go far enough, may one day be a map for others to follow. This is kind of like the pep talk. Like we can do this. <laughs> this is what we're here to do. We're, I mean, the lectures are fun, but the practices are what's important. And Sometimes you just do the practices, you, don't, you're not, you feel silly doing them, but you stay open-minded about it. And if you persist, you will, you will verify things for yourself. And then you will start to take those steps. When you verify one thing, then it's, it's like almost like a boost. Like it helps you. Like, yes, okay, well, I, this is true. Now I can 
it gives you extra energy to go and verify other things. It gives you that that charge that you need sometimes that says, mm, uh, I could go practice, but there's a good show coming up on the television and I'm tired because I've worked hard. These are obstacles that we have to overcome. Work hard to verify some things. It becomes easier to work to verify others. So that's esoteric and pseudo esoteric schools. It was kind of a shorter one, but I thought you guys would want to meditate longer, maybe. So, any questions? Hey, going back to the mediums, I remember having read in a book that uh, one time the master, when he developed clairvoyance, he went to one of those seances. Seances, mm -hmm. seances, mm -hmm. and then he could see that there was like a shadow coming to the medium. So they, they they would say, "Oh, we're going to invoke Jesus Christ," and then the medium said, "Oh, I am Jesus Christ. I am talking to you. Do this, do that. Uh, love each other." And then the master said that there was like a, sh uh, a shadow. There was like a black magician behind the medium that was taking place, that was like uh, talking uh, for the medium. So yeah. it's... Uh, it's uh, From another plane? Back from another, another plane. Another, another plane, yes. So it's just a dark, 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 dark entity. entity. A dark entity mm -hmm. was taking... But she the, thought that it really was? She thought exactly. that it was uh, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. then everybody thought about then the Master said, no, I won't. I will never ever go yeah. back to those sayings because they mm -hmm. they mislead people. Mm -hmm. so, even the medium they, is misled. And the medium, the medium they truly believe that yeah. they yeah. And the karma of the medium is the epilepsy. So the, the epilepsy is the mm -hmm. karma of the mediums. Mm -hmm. Epilepsy. Oh, epilepsy. The, yeah. the, yeah. the yeah. disease. The karma. It's the karma. It can be a karma for mm -hmm. past life mediums. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I went to that spiritual thing and there was a woman there and she was able to channel like she just, her, her voice, everything totally changed. She said this other yeah, person was speaking, voice, right? Everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, another entity can come into yeah, the person. That's what she was saying. Oh, wow. yeah. well, it probably did, but just yeah. the nature of that entity is what's in question. Yeah, yeah. like three <laughs> different entities. Like from yeah, different, really. one said that, that uh, he had never been like in a physical body or something for mm -hmm. years or talk to people, I don't know, just to the weird stuff. Yeah. Well, there was that famous, uh, I think she's popular now, her name was Ramatha, Ramatha or Ramatha. Mm -hmm. She claimed to channel an alien from a different civilization. And she mm -hmm. has a school in America. And many people come to her and she tells them things. But she, one of the things she tells people is we're already divine. We're already gods. Which is kind of like, it sounds very nice, but it's, it's not exactly, people like want to hear that, they want to hear oh, yeah. that we're already fully Feeding developed. Feeding their egos, aren't yeah. you? Well, that's just like but it also misleads like, people from the past. Yeah, you, all those people like for self-image and say, well, you're all lovable. Yeah. 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 And even the, in the, I mean, I know there's like a lot of conspiracies out there, but there are, there are major politicians and corporations that gather at specific events, and they might not know what they're part of, but what takes place before them is what they think is some kind of play, but it's really a black ritual. And uh, all the, a lot of politicians and major media people go there from the states. It's a, it was called uh, Bohemian Grove. Presidents go there. They watch a ritual. They think it's a play. There's a big owl which represents like Moloch, like a, a demon. They they have people dressed in cloaks. They they uh, carry torches and they carry a, an effigy of a, of a small child and they burn it in front of this big owl. And then oh the people God. are clapping and laughing. They think they're part of some <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> fraternity <laughs> kind of play, but it's really a, a black ritual dedicated to dark forces. So th this, is, this is how black lodges yes. also operate. It doesn't matter if you know or if, you, if, you, if you're not 100% a consenting, willing participant. You can participate. They can gather your energy by if you're yes. there, you're watching this. You're so that's what that. they do it for, to get the people's get energy. Those people's energy. Yeah, or they can do it so Is that. It? I mean, the, the reason why they they do it would be that 
whoever put it together knows some occult principles and they know that if they do this with a large group of people up front, they will personally receive favors from these negative entities. And negative Would it do entities. anything to the audience? Would they? Well, they themselves, yeah, they're, they're watching it, they're participating, they're, yes. it, it, so they it's, um, negative energy. yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, Mama. it's abstract, it's uh, taking from them certain, certain emotions because they're, they're seeing these things and they're feeling certain things and their, their vibrations are changing. Well, if they're liking it, and it's me, it's bad. Yeah, that's what happens, yes. Yeah. So, how can you, dis how can we distinguish which dedicates yes. to black entities, like sometimes people go and they think that's good thing, but it turns to be a yeah. bad thing. So yeah. how can we distinguish this, right? Do yeah. Can we and this is why I said it's the, mo the black schools are the most difficult to distinguish because they, they never come out straight out and say, no, of course I'm a black school. Yeah. I mean... So how can we understand that it's yeah, not good? That we thing. don't fall trapped yeah. to these. Yeah, right. That's interesting. Well, yeah, like, it's like you never know, right? That is true. But I mean, the schools that teach you about the the three uh, factors about the death of the ego, the spiritual birth that you have to create the bodies, and the alchemical work. Those schools, uh, the the black schools, will teach the op kind of the opposite. They, will, they might teach, like, go forward and multiply, like telling you to spill the creative energy or something like that. Um, but it is, it is, it's difficult. This because is why it we, gets you down. That yep. takes you down. It's difficult. Like, we have to basically do the internal work on ourselves to reach a certain mm -hmm. level so that we can see these things for ourselves. But generally, I mean, I, I, I've seen a bunch of these black, uh, black lodges or schools or whatever, and, and there is kind of a weird vibe. Sometimes you just have to trust your mm -hmm. intuition. Because yeah. I'm, I'm thinking there's these people from the media were sitting here watching this fake child being burned. They must have a certain feeling like, well, this doesn't yeah. feel exactly right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of a play is this? Where they're, they're showing, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's hidden. So that's right, you know, it is. It's in very well, sometimes you go to those things and they have those sacred dances yep. and everybody's supposed to participate. Well, maybe it is black magic instead of... Mm -hmm. Or right. is it harmless? Is it just because apparently it's... Right. Well, like, I guess, like in the like, like true black magic, they, they utilize certain, certain keys that they would teach that have to do with tantric practices black tantric practices. So the ones who put on, say this, Bohemian Grow as an example that we've been using. People come and they're there, but are they, like they're participating and they're giving their energy, but the people who, who are putting it on, who, mm -hmm. the, they're the ones who are really truly into black magic because they have these keys. The keys for white magic and black magic all relate to the, the sexual energy. So. Yeah, I actually read in uh, one of Samuel Yor's book, uh, he mentions how um, a lot of the Hollywood system is submerged in that the, the theaters are now the local black lodges yeah, in every black city lodge, yeah. or something like that. I right. think it's an interesting concept because it's, it's a lot like uh, what you were describing. You're, you're watching a movie, you're identifying with mm -hmm. the scenario of the, mm -hmm. the individual and you're you're confusing your emotions with their emotions, yeah. and and uh, it leaves very room, a lot of room yeah. to like lose. Because objectively, if right someone were to objectively watch what was happening, would be your body sitting there doing nothing and staring at a box. Yeah. But when we're doing when we're doing that, we feel totally immersed. We have certain egos that are just running rampant because we think we're that character, we're in that situation, we're excited and scared for them, and it's producing in us false emotion, basically, false feeling. It's fortifying, can fortify ego.